good morning or good afternoon and good evening to to you. We have members on the line from around the globe, so I'm not exactly sure where you are. Um, it is early afternoon here in Washington, D.C. I would like to welcome you to this uh, this webinar we're putting on, Getting to Yes, Influence You Can Bank On, as part of our early career webinar series. Um, during this session, you'll learn a simple three-step influencing model that you can apply to any situation. Specifically, you'll learn the secrets to making meaningful connections with people, flexing your communication style, asking effective questions, and getting people to say yes to your projects, plans, and pro projects, plans, and proposals. Uh, today's session is being put on by Roger Grannis, the principal of the Grannis Group. Roger is actually the son of a lifetime member of IEEE. He understands engineers and has dedicated his career to helping them communicate more effectively. He has improved business performance at some of the biggest names in business, GE, Underwriters Laboratories, Simtac, Pepsi, Royal Bank of Scotland, Foot Locker, and many more. Uh, prior to forming the Grannis Group in 2005, Roger spent 17 years at Gartner. He contributed to growing revenues from $22 million to $850 million by building Gartner Sales University, launching Gartner's popular podcast, uh, Talking Technology, and shepherding the rollout of dozens of company acquisitions. Uh, with that, we'll get started, and I'd like to introduce you to Roger Grannis, who will be presenting today. Roger? Eric, thank you. Thank you for that uh, friendly introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, get a few tips. Uh, one of my uh, things that I don't like to do is waste people's time. So I'd like to make this interactive. If you've got questions, comments, if you'd like more information uh, or want me to move on, please go to your uh, question and answer uh, box there. Uh, just type in a question. You can make a statement or uh, ask a question. But I want you to get value out of this. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've picked and choosed, uh, chosen the most important tips that I find uh, my audiences uh, get the most value out of. So hopefully uh, there will be some value for you. But again, please get engaged and uh, be part of this. Ask questions as we go, and we'll save a little time at the end for questions as well. Uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, I'm the happy child of a lifetime member of uh, the IEEE. That's my dad over on the right in the picture there, Roland Granis. Uh, that was a lunch we had in San Francisco many years ago. It was the uh, hours before I got a job offer to join Gartner and uh, moved to Connecticut two days later. We did not know that was uh, transpiring at that time. So as uh, Eric mentioned, uh, I've spent most of my career at Gartner. Prior to that, I worked for, if, if you're old enough, back in the early 80s, there was a, the first portable computer called the Osborne. Uh, it weighed, I think, 17 pounds. It ran on uh, CPM. Uh, and so I worked for Adam Osborne, not at his computer company, but he had a book publishing company. And so one thing I noticed there that I noticed throughout my career is that the authors of the books much like other technical experts like yourselves, have lots of information, and they needed help synthesizing it, simplifying it, and making it easy to understand for other people. So I've really, at Osborne, at Gartner and Granis Group, I've really spent my career helping technical people sound good, getting their ideas across clearly, being more persuasive, being more influential. So that's... Uh, my love, and I hopefully will pass along some tips that are either new to you or will reinforce some things you, you may already know. Uh, yeah, Eric said to give a quick 10-second plug. Uh, at Granis Group, we provide workshops, coaching, and speaking, uh, again, to help people, especially technical experts, speak well, be more influential, and be better leaders. So I thought I would start with the most common influencing mistakes I've seen uh, over the years. Number one is when we're trying to influence another person, we tend to go in and just start trying to solve a problem. We don't make a connection. So it's really important to make a personal, to make a personal and business connection, make a connection with the other person. We'll talk about ways to do that. 
Number two is uh, we tend to go in and talk too much. We go in and we pitch, we present, and we deliver. Again, it goes back to my early days working at the publishing company when the authors came in to tell the sales force about their new book, they would describe chapter one in detail, chapter two in detail, way too much information. So they needed to, again, simplify and synthesize that for uh, the mere mortal sales team. Uh, also in t uh, terms of content, what I typically see is too much information, which leaves the other person or the audience feeling uh, information overload, way too much information. It's kind of like today. There's so much information out there online in the world, we're bombarded. What we need to do is identify the most important things and serve as a almost like an editor, so you've got all this information in your head. When you're presenting that to the person you're trying to influence, you've got to pick out just the right information and present it in a clear way that resonates with the other person. So too much information, uh, it's not tailored to the other person. We, we tend to deliver information the way we want to receive it. What we need to do is flip that and present it in a way that they want to receive it. It's, it's not easy, uh, it takes practice. Again, I'll share some tips on that today. Uh, another mistake I see us making uh, is especially with uh, technical experts, we tend to focus on making the case using logic. There's certainly a place for logic. Uh, we as engineers uh, want to have things logical. When it comes time to influencing, we've got to consider the emotions involved. What's important to the other person? What are their emotional drivers? So we'll talk, talk about that today. All right, so those are some common influencing mistakes, and let's move on. Hey, I'd like you to uh, consider applying what we're talking today to something you're working on right now. Is there somebody at work or in your personal life that you need to persuade or influence? Maybe think about them personally as we're going through this so that you can apply the lessons uh, immediately, and, and, and you know, when it comes time after this call to go do some influencing, you can practice and hopefully succeed at, at those new skills. All right, so this is our model. Uh, uh, hopefully you're now seeing something that says connect, ask, present. That is our influencing model. I try to simplify it. Three simple steps. We want to connect with the other person. We want to ask good questions and certainly listen to their answers and then present well so that we increase our chances of being successful at getting to yes. All right, let's begin with the three keys to connecting with other people. I'm going to start with key number one, find things in common. Let me start with a story. So I live in Connecticut about 90 minutes from New York City. We're out in the woods uh, just this morning. A woodpecker was uh, pecking right outside my office window. Very distracting. <laughs> so. But I, as we live in a, like a small cabin, and so to have space for an office, 20 years ago we bought a, a, a even smaller cabin across the street where I would go to work and occasional guests would stay. Now that my kids are grown, they're out of the house, we back in August put the house, the cottage, on the market. And so we interviewed three realtors. You see the, their logos on the screen there, Sotheby's. Coldwell Banker and William Ravis. Those are three popular uh, realtors in Connecticut and the Northeast. And we chose the realtor for three reasons. One of them was we had things in common. She went out of her way to ask us questions, and it turns out we knew people. She had sold a house across the street before we moved into the neighborhood. Uh, she worked with other people that had worked in the neighborhood. Um, so we had people in common. That helped make a connection. Again, number, number one is to connect. One of those ways is to find things in common. So we had mutual friends in common. Uh, the second thing she did was she, she found things in common with us. She herself 
had owned a cabin on another lake up in northern Connecticut. So there was this, this, this mutual, we're, we're, we're both lake people. So we felt the connection with the people, and we had this lake house thing in common. And then finally, she communicated in our language. You know, people who live on lakes, they're not, we're, not, uh, or we're not stiff corporate executives. We tend to be uh, relaxed. Uh, we have a lot of uh, neighbor activities. We've got a lot of artists in the neighborhood. So she, she kind of brought that out in herself, and, and she felt us feel understood. So, again, key number one, find things in common, which she did people, uh, communication style, and that whole lake lifestyle. So when it comes time to influencing somebody else, find some common ground, find things you have in common. There's even some science behind this. There's an old saying among salespeople that people like people who are like them and people buy from people who are like them. One of the top experts in the field of persuasion and influence is uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, he's a professor emeritus uh, at, I think, Arizona State. And he has six principles of influence. One of them is to find things in common. He's got scientific data that backs up what I'm saying. And he says that people prefer to say yes to those they know and like. So you'll be more likable to the other person if you find things in common and if you speak their language. So how about you? What about that person you're trying to influence? What do you have in common with them? And if you don't know, how can you find out? So maybe you're both members of IEEE. Uh, maybe you went to the same college or you're both soccer parents. You, your children uh, maybe play soccer or you're big soccer fans. Uh, does anyone know what that diagram is in the lower left corner? That is a Wheatstone Bridge. Uh, the only reason I know that is my dad uh, helped my sister with a science project in high school called the Wheatstone Bridge. When I was doing some work for GE Oil and Gas, uh, one of the concepts they wanted their engineers to communicate to non-technical people was how uh, a Wheatstone Bridge works. What were the principles behind that? So maybe you've got some engineering uh, interests in common. Maybe you have a hobby, like going hiking. Uh, so find things in common. So I was teaching a class in Boston on communications uh, last year, and I said I was telling a story about my daughter, and I said she went to a college in the middle of the United States in a state called Iowa at a school you've probably never heard of called Grinnell College. And boom, right then, somebody raised their hand and said, I went to Grinnell College. Well, we spent, he and I, uh, the lunch hour talking about the small town in Iowa, about the train tracks that go through campus, about the frontier diner where everyone goes uh, out, you know, uh, on the weekends and at night. And so we felt this connection. You probably felt that yourself when you're, maybe you're traveling, uh, you're on a, a, a plane, you talk to somebody next to you, and by golly, you both uh, lived in San Francisco for a while. Don't you feel a connection with them when that happens? Or you've both uh, traveled to a country, uh, you know, the same country. So again, uh, there's scientific proof behind this. You've probably experienced that yourself. So it makes sense uh, to find things in common with the person you're trying to influence. And by the way, uh, these are skills, of course, uh, we're assuming you're coming from a place of ethics and integrity, uh, and you're, you're not going to use these as tricks. Uh, if you use these to manipulate other people to do things that are not right, that's not appropriate. Most people can, can figure out when somebody's, uh, you know, trying to manipulate them. So these are skills that work, but, of course, we're assuming your, your intentions are pure. All right, so let's move to... Uh, the second way to connect with other people, and that is flexing your communication style. The key here is to mirror and match the other person in terms of how they present, just their communication style. So here's a way uh, you can do that. Let's see, I'm kind of stuck on this slide here. That's interesting. 
Let me go to the manual method and try it. Okay, interesting. Hmm, I don't know if Debbie is still on. I am having trouble moving to the next slide. Is, am I still on? Can somebody just uh, send me a chat text? Hey, we can hear you, Roger. Everything's fine. Are you there? Yeah, yeah Roger. We can still okay, hear great. you. You, um, you trying to move to slide 14? I'm trying to go to 13 now. Uh, push to audio. Yeah, I'm just stuck. Uh, can you manually take over by chance, or? Um, yeah. Slide okay, 13. So I want to go to 13. Now, if I'm in presenter mode, I don't know. Now. Okay. You see, you see a pic Yeah, you see a picture of people. Mr. Rogers, Obama, yep. Mother Teresa. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm not going to be able to see it large, but I know it's on the on the slides. All right. So our goal here is to be deliberate about matching the other person's communication style. And here's a super valuable tool to do this. Some of you may have been through communication style training in the past. DISC, D-I-S-C, is the most popular instrument. So this uh, might be new to some or a good refresher to others. So on the screen, you see on the left four people. Now these are, uh, while they are U.S.-centric, hopefully our global uh, non-U.S. Uh, listeners will recognize these people, maybe except for the first one. So what we, want, what we want to do now is take a look at, let's start with the person in the upper left. That is uh, Mr. Rogers. Now he, for those of you outside the U.S., was a kind, gentle children's uh, talk show host. So he had a children's program. Now when we look at him, we want to analyze his communication style and match it with one of the four people over on the right. So what do you remember about Mr. Rogers? Well, in terms of his communication style, he's, so, he's soft-spoken, uh, he's very nurturing, he's very people-focused. So those are some of the clues we've got in terms of when it comes time to analyze someone else's communication style. As we look at the four people over on the right, which of those four, we've got Hillary Clinton, Mother Teresa, I'm going clockwise, Bill Gates, and Oprah Winfrey. Hopefully you, you all know those folks. Which of those four people is more soft-spoken, uh, more gentle and nurturing, and more people-focused? Well, probably let's go with Mother Teresa. Right, okay. So let's, let's now match the communication style of the next person on the left. That would be President Donald Trump. Now, one of the keys to influencing other people is you've got to strip out your own personal beliefs. I know this person uh, creates uh, emotional reactions uh, across the spectrum. So let's just take that out of the picture for a minute and analyze his communication style. So he's probably more uh, opposite of Mr. Rogers. He's direct, uh, fast-paced, blunt. Uh, he, he probably is more concerned about the task, the job at hand, than the people. So he's really the, the direct opposite of Mr. Rogers. Now over on the right, who is high energy, direct, and blunt? Well, Oprah Winfrey is high energy, but she's probably a little more people focused. So, and Bill Gates is more soft spoken. Uh, so Hillary Clinton, ironically, uh, 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 Donald Trump's uh, competitor, uh, it, they're the same communication style. She's high energy, blunt, direct, uh, more task focused than people. All right, let's move down the list to Robin Williams. Well, we've only got two people left, uh, Oprah Winfrey and Bill Gates. Well, Bill Gates is soft spoken, Oprah is not. But the other thing that Robin Williams and Oprah have in common is they're more people-focused. So high energy, they're not direct and blunt, they're more flowing, they more, uh, they're more flexible. So Robin Williams and Oprah Winfrey have similar communication styles. Now you might think that uh, former President Obama and Bill Gates, mm, they're not really alike. Well, if we analyze Obama a little bit more, 
when he's speaking, when he's giving a speech and he's on the teleprompter, he certainly is much more like Oprah, lively, people-focused. When he's in his uh, natural element, though, when he's just uh, speaking, say, in an interview or a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you'll see that his style is a lot like Bill Gates. It's very slow, uh, very thoughtful, very deliberate, very specific, much like Bill Gates. Now, all people have all of these communication traits in them. It's just when we're influencing somebody else, we want to see what their primary style is and then communicate our message in their way. All right, let's move to the next slide. That would be slide uh, 14. And again, this just summarizes how to determine what communication style the other person is. We've got a couple of dimensions. One is pace. Are they faster or are they more moderate and so, uh, softer? Let's move to slide 15. The other dimension is their priority. Are they focused more on the task and are they logical, or are they more people and flowing accepting? And we'll move now to slide uh, 16. And there we are. These are the dimensions put together. We've got four communication styles. I'm going to start upper left, working my way clockwise. Dominance, they're fast and task focused. Influence, fast people. Steadiness, they're more moderate paced and people focused. And then what we call C, or conscientiousness, moderate or task-focused. Uh, by the way, there's all kinds of free information online. about. If you just type in DISC, D-I-S-E, you can read up uh, uh, all about this on your uh, own time for more information. Uh, and certainly learn more in, in uh, one of my workshops, of course. Uh, all right, so let's move to 17. And so here we've got the four pairings uh, and a summary there of the four communication styles. Again, the dominance, they're direct, strong-willed, results-driven. The influencers are very outgoing, lively, enthusiastic, optimistic. Everything's going to be great. The steadiness, they're more nurturing. They're slower paced. They're accommodating. They like to say yes to every project. Uh, they're very diplomatic. They hate conflict. The conscientiousness, we find a lot of engineers in this bucket. Maybe you identify with that communication style. Very analytical, tend to be more reserved. They highly value precision. They're very uh, systematic about how they go about things. Now, it's interesting. My three children are in three different uh, communication styles. My son is lively and outgoing. Uh, He's, uh, he leads uh, outdoor trips with young children. Uh, my daughter, one daughter is uh, steadiness. She teaches uh, elementary school. Uh, my other daughter is uh, studying to be an acupuncturist. She's very analytical and slow. And my wife goes, you know, what's wrong with these children? Like, especially the, the conscientious daughter. I said, sweetie, she's just, she just communicates differently. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, think about, the uh, again, the person you're trying to influence. What is their style? If you find yourself um, having conflict with another person in terms of not their personal beliefs, but just the way they communicate, they're probably in the diagonal opposite corner from you. That's where the conflicts come because you don't have the pace or the priority of task or people in common. So I'm uh, an influencer, upper right corner. That's my natural state. Uh, I can also get very detailed. It, it just takes a little more effort. Um, but my mother, for example, is a conscientiousness person. So when we go on vacation together, I just want to, hey, show up and figure it out as we go. And I tell her, oh, it's going to be great. We're going to have a wonderful time. Everything's going to work out fine. And she says, your father didn't raise you this way, him being an engineer, of course. Uh, she wants the precise agenda. She wants to know what time is breakfast. When does the bus pick us up? What time is the next tour? So she and I butt heads uh, have a conflict that way. But if we recognize it's just the communication style difference, 
it makes us understand each other, and then we can flex. And, and I know on vacations, I just need to be a lot more detailed so she's not uh, stressing out and panicking when it comes time to knowing what we're doing each day. Let's move now to slide 18. This is one of the most important things because this is where we've got to get out of our natural state and shift our focus and present to the other person this way. In the workshops, what I do is have each of the four styles to go to one of the four corners in the room, and they tell us exactly, this is what we like about our style, and when you need to present to us, please present your information in this way. And by golly, all over the world, in every class, the answers are always the same. The dominance people say, just give us bullet points. Be specific and clear. Get the efficient. Don't waste my time. And by goodness, by golly, please don't waste my time talking about my family and vacations. Get to the point and tell me straight. Don't sugar. Don't, don't make it, uh, we call it here in the States, sugar coating. Uh, just tell me exactly what you're saying, what you're feeling. Don't uh, make it all nicey-nicey. The influencers, they want to have fun. They want liveliness. They want you to ask them about their goals and their dreams. Uh, they, they want you to be positive, upbeat, energizing. They do want to spend time socializing, talking about their families, a sports team. Uh, they want you to connect that way. They want uh, stories. They don't want the boring spreadsheets. Now, as engineers, that's probably the biggest adjustment we need to, to make. It's, it's hard for us to believe that people would actually want us to tell stories and say things like, trust me on this new, uh, new uh, gizmo, this new invention. It's going to be great. No, we know as engineers we want to know, uh, we want people to come in prepared, give us the data behind us. We want all the details. Uh, we want a time to think this through and decide. We want to know the other people have done their homework. So again, conscientiousness wants all of those details. Moving to the, back to the right, the steadiness in the green, we've got to slow down our delivery. Uh, they need nurturing. We want to support their feelings. We don't want to create any, say anything that's going to be threatening or create conflict. Uh, we, went to, we want to emphasize people how this is going to support people, how it's going to help the team. So again, we've got to shift. We've got to shift our style. We want to communicate our message in the style of the other person. All right, let's move now to slide 19. Let's do a quick example. So here's a restaurant that mm, hopefully 90% of the people on the call are aware of. It's called the Cheesecake Factory. So this is a restaurant that's got a big menu, Lots of items to satisfy every need. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, think of a restaurant in your hometown, in your country, in your neighborhood that uh, appeals to everybody. It's got something for everybody. Meats, vegetarian, seafood, lots of kinds of desserts and whatnot. So uh, if we're going to, let's go back now to slide 18. So if we're going to influence people to go to the Cheesecake Factory for dinner, let's just practice. So, okay, if we're, going to, we're going to influence a dominance person to go to the Cheesecake Factory. What would we say? How about great menu, something for everyone, we can get a reservation at 6 o'clock. That's all they want to hear. Now, notice the difference between that approach and let's move over to the influencers. What would we say there? It is is such a fun place. We can get drinks. We can talk. They've got TVs where we can watch the game. We can have a great time. Oh my gosh. It, people there, the waiters, they are happy. They're upbeat. We're going to come out feeling real recharged. See the difference? Now you engineers, we engineers would think, oh my goodness, nobody would ever want to hear that kind of talk. When I say this in the workshops, the influencers light up. They love it. 
All right, let's go down to the steadiness, folks. So we want to we want to soften our delivery. We want to emphasize people and team. And you might say something like, "Well, I'm thinking we might want to go to the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, they've got some some quiet tables in the back. Uh, give us a chance to have a really good conversation, reconnect. Uh, if you want, we could bring other members of the team." It'll really help us bond. And you know what's nice about it is I know a lot of us have different tastes in eating. They have got something for everyone. So everyone will be happy. Uh, they've got gluten-free. They've got dairy-free. They've got farm-to-table. They've got uh, vegetarian, seafood, meats. Uh, so that way everyone will be, will be taken care of. Now, how about the conscientious folks, we engineers? Okay, we'll want to know about the menu. We might want to spell out the different categories. They've got different meat dishes, maybe lists, steaks, chicken. Uh, they've got pasta, tortellini, boom, boom, boom. You're going to go through the details. Uh, they've got great Yelp reviews, 4.8 on a uh, scale of 5. Uh, they've got uh, validated parking. So lots and lots of details. You see the difference? So think about the person you need to influence. And you're going to want to craft your message and deliver it in the way that in some of the examples that I just gave. All right, let's move now to slide 20. Uh, let's see if you've got any questions. I'm not sure if that is working given my uh, screen malfunction earlier. Let me see here. Yeah, let's just go to questions. Okay, I don't, I don't see any, but feel free to write those in if you'd like. Um, this is the third key to connecting with people. We want to see their point of view. Uh, let me just tell a quick story. This is my uh, backyard in the backwoods of Connecticut uh, near New York. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, back in the days of flip phones, I had to walk to the airport. Uh, not walk to the airport. I had to drive to the airport. But I had to move from my house, walk through the yard into the red barn there to get to my car. Well, it was a, a rainy night. Uh, there was a drizzle. Uh, there was a partial moon. So there was this sort of uh, purple coloring to the yard. It was almost like a horror film, like a, you know, a scary movie. And you know how things, uh, when something's different, it jumps out. Maybe you're driving through your neighborhood on the way home from work and somebody painted their house or there's a, a new car in front. That one thing that's different jumps out. Well, as I was walking with my suitcase through the yard that, that night, at, it was about 4.30 in the morning, uh, something was different. The tree was there, that bush with the white... Uh, uh, Buds was there, the garage was there, but standing right in front of the garage, uh, right center of the picture, was a person. And uh, this is a fenced-in yard, uh, and uh, there's somebody in the yard. I think I am going to be killed. Uh, so I screamed for help. Nothing happened. I got out my flip phone. I guess I thought I was Spock for a minute, and I said, held it up. I said, hold it right there. Uh, the object did not move. I, I, I got a little bit closer. Turns out it was a woman soaking wet, uh, cold, drenched. And in that moment, I saw the world through her eyes, from her point of view, and realized that she was in trouble. Something bad had happened at home several blocks away. She had taken a run and found a hiding space in my yard. So again, by seeing the world through her point of view, I realized that she had been a victim and I was not about to become one. So my phone call to the police was one to help her, not to help me. Let's move to slide 21. Uh, Henry Ford said something to this effect. If there's any secret to success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from their angle as well as your own. Moving now to the next slide, slide 22. Uh, we tend to focus about what we need, what's important to us, and the client, the other the person we're trying to influence, we don't think that much about them. So what we want to do is reverse that on slide 23. We want to put the client first and see what the world looks like through their eyes. And moving to the next slide, 24, uh, we not only want to think about them, but in a work environment, they're probably reporting to and being influenced by somebody else. So we want to think about what 
pressures and priorities our clients have, uh, what is influencing them? If we can help them reach a goal, for example, or reduce a pressure that they're feeling from their goals at work or their supervisor, their boss, their leader, uh, we want to take that into consideration. So uh, again, there's a whole lot more analysis we could put into that, but we're, we're, uh, we're giving you a, a quick summary of the principles here. So think about what's important to the other person and what might be influencing them. All right, moving to slide 25. So we've just closed out C, connect with other people. We've call, uh, talked about the three ways to do that. Let's move now to the A in CAP, A for ask. It's not, a just, not just about asking, but we certainly want to listen. Moving to slide 26, two of the most basic human needs and wants are to be heard and understood. I mean, especially in today's world where we're bombarded by messages, text messages, emails, phone calls, uh, people don't take time to feel heard and understood. So if we can give the person we're trying to influence an opportunity to, to have to be listened to, to make that human connection, to feel heard and understood, they will appreciate us and be much more receptive to what we have to say. Uh, let's go to 27, picture of Steve Jobs many years ago with his wife. If you've read his biography, uh, it is one of the best business books I've ever read. Uh, from a personal perspective, he describes uh, to the author how he met his wife. He was giving a lecture at Stanford University. He noticed her. Uh, he uh, found her in the parking lot. They started chatting. They, I think, went out to dinner and then chatted into the wee hours of the night. The reason he fell in love was because she got me. She, he made her, I'm sorry, she made him feel heard and understood. Now, of course, his brain is wired maybe differently than a lot of us. He's a genius, uh, very motivated. So for somebody like that, who's so unique, to feel heard and understood, it made him feel special, it made him fall in love. Uh, let's go to 28. Uh, some of you may remember Dan Aykroyd, one of the first actors on Saturday Night Live, a uh, program I think known to most people. Um, he was in a movie called Loser, and his son is being, he's dropping his son off at college, and his son says to him, Dad, how do I make new friends? I'm in the new city, a big city, we come from a small town. And he says, Son, do you want to know the secret to making friends? It's this. Interested is interesting. If you're interested in the other people, you get them talking about yourself, they will find you to be very interesting. Now, this may be common sense, but it's just a lesson to remember and to reinforce. Get people talking about them. They want to feel heard and understood. And most importantly, moving to slide 29, we'll find out what's important to them relative to the thing that we're trying to influence them on. Now, the first thing we think about is what are their project or departmental goals? What do we have that can help them achieve that goal? If we can show what we need for ourselves and show the other person the link between the two, that will help us advance our cause. So we don't want to stop there, though. Let's go to slide 30. We want to think about how does that project or tar departmental goal fit into the goals of the organization? Maybe in a, uh, a nonprofit, it's uh, achieving higher satisfaction with membership. Maybe if it's a business, it's increasing revenues or increasing customer satisfaction. So you want to present your solution in a way that meets the departmental goals but also fits into the bigger picture because that person you're trying to influence may have to influence the person up the, the ladder uh, and get, uh, get money to pay for this. So if you can give them ideas, that person you're trying to influence, ideas on how this fits into the organizational goals, it will give them a talk track, some ammunition to help them sell it to the next person up the ladder. Similarly, 
We want to find out and know what's important to them personally. What are their hopes and dreams? So that you're, you're fine. that's where we really tap into their emotions. What's important to them personally? So to get people to start talking, uh, you need to ask questions. Let's go to slide 31. Uh, this is kind of question asking uh, skills basics, 101 as we call it in the States. Uh, ask meaningful questions. Open-ended questions elicit longer, more detailed answers. What's important to you about this? Versus if we were to start with closed-ended questions, who did this? What happened? When did it happen? Those bring about shorter answers. They also might feel, uh, make the person feel interrogated, like you're a lawyer, and a, uh, a lawyer, uh, I'm just blanking on the word, a ballast, what's the word in Europe, uh, in England for ballast? Shoot, I'm, I'm blanking on it. I know you don't call them lawyers, but anyway, the person who uh, studies the law, uh, ballast, bella, bella, Eh, maybe somebody will type it in. Anyway, uh, they might make the person, if we start with closed-ended questions, might make the person feel interrogated, uh, like they're being uh, you know, on trial. So let's move to slide 32. The ideal format when we're trying to learn the other person's requirements so that we're then able to uh, target our message to them. Uh, we want to ask questions in a funnel format, start broad and open-ended, and then end with the closed-ended questions. Uh, slide 33, uh, influencing questions. Uh, when we're trying to identify, let's say, uh, uh, where they are with a project uh, or a specific challenge, tell me about the, ch the challenge you're facing with this. Let's find out next, how are you addressing it now? Uh, if you could have any solution you want, what might that look like? So now they're, they're painting a picture for you that you can later use to link your arguments, if you will, uh, to, to help uh, be more persuasive and uh, influential. Moving to slide 34, uh, we certainly want to listen. So if we're in a meeting to understand somebody's requirements, we should certainly be talking, uh, I'm sorry, be, be listening a lot more than we're telling. Uh, if we move to slide 35, the ideal ratio would be about 75% listening 25% telling. Okay, so that's ask. We've talked about connect. We've talked about asking and listening and how to do that, why it's important. Let's now look at some tips on how to present well. Let's go to slide 37. Well, we certainly, uh, we talked about this earlier, D-I-S-C. Number one is to present information in the other person's language. So again, we covered this earlier with the Cheesecake Factory as an example. That's what you've got to do. So identify the other person's style based on how they show up. Remember, fast paced, slower paced. Are they more people focused? Are they more task focused? And then present this way. If you remember nothing else, think about the opposite style and, and shift your approach to be to, to add some elements of the other style. So if you're a dominance person, don't, you know, don't be so direct and blunt. Slow down, be kind and gentle. If you're a conscientiousness person, loosen up a little bit, start the conversation with some small talk. Similarly, if you're an influencer, bring in that agenda, bring in some details, slow it down a little bit, uh, give them time to decide. All right, number two, let's move to slide 38. I said earlier one of the biggest mistakes is we tend to be just logic focused. We need to bring in an element of emotion. So let's use an example. Uh, here, uh, I apologize, it's another U.S. example. Um, in California, we've had a lot of wildfires. So what happens in the August and September, October timeframe the, the grass is all dry, uh, and the winds pick up. And what happens in the high winds is power lines blow down, they spark on the ground, and they start fires. So what the power company has started doing, Pacific Gas and Electric, is they have uh, blackouts. In periods of high wind, 
they just shut down the power. And that can be uh, several hours. It could be a couple of days. People don't like their power shut off. It's very inconvenient. So if PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, were to just, uh, let's say, present to the public a logic uh, argument, it would sound something like this. Last year, uh, uh, power, uh, last year, 15 power, down powers, uh, power lines started uh, fires. Uh, three of those caused over a million dollars of damage. Uh, we are stopping, we're turning off the power so that we reduce the incidence of fire. All good arguments, they all make sense. What if we were to add an element of, log- of emotion to that? And say last year, 8,000 people lost their homes. Uh, 12 people lost their lives. We never want that to happen again. We want our customers to uh, live in their houses, have their houses stay and put, and avoid this tragedy. So you're bringing in that, that emotional element. It just makes the argument appeal to emotions a little bit, uh, and a lot of people are... Uh, motivated by emotion. In fact, moving to slide 39, uh, C.S. Lewis, who's an author, Lewis, an author, said, more truth is comprehended through the emotions than the intellect. A uh, fellow speaker friend of mine, Doug Stevenson, says, emotion is the fast lane to the brain. So I would just urge you all to bring in some emotion. And it will tie back to what's important to the other person uh, that we would have found out. Oh, barrister, there it is. Thank you. I finally looked at that. Barrister is the term for you're a lawyer in Europe. Anyway, we, we, we digress. Um, so, again, uh, you'll learn about what's important to the other person. What are their emotional drivers by just studying them, analyzing them? But in that conversation, you will have had when you're listening to them. All right, let's move to slide 41. What are some hopes and fears by those four communication styles? Uh, There they are on the screen. Uh, The D's, dominance, like control. They fear losing control. The I's want admiration. So you could emphasize how this project is going to help them look good. Uh, The boss will love you. Uh, Your your, uh, survey scores will go up. Uh, The S's don't like confrontation. Remember, these are the, uh, the kind, nurturing people. They want to be liked, and they don't want conflict or confrontation. Uh, the C's, which probably men of, many of us are, uh, value accuracy, and they don't want to be embarrassed. So don't make them uh, make a decision right away. Uh, they often don't want to present in, in to groups. So help them uh, maybe co-present or uh, help them uh, feel more comfortable, giving them time to practice and rehearse versus asking them to just uh, come up and present right away. So I'm going to jump now to slide 44. We've talked about appealing to logic and emotion, but as Aristotle said, there are three modes of persuasion. Uh, Moving to slide 46, the third being ethos, you. How are you viewed in the eyes of the person you're trying to influence? So you want to be credible. Uh, Let's move to slide uh, 47. How can you bolster your credibility? How can you improve your credibility? Certainly by simply coming prepared, presenting in their style is one way, uh, finding out what's important to them and linking your solution to uh, their uh, issue, uh, not wasting their time. Uh, If they don't know you, maybe talking a little bit about your credentials or have somebody introduce you who can uh, speak highly of you. So you want to be credible in the eyes of the person you're uh, uh, trying to influence. And then finally, slide 48, you want to bring value. So when I was doing work with uh, GE Capital, uh, I did a study of uh, leaders and influencers and salespeople. And I said, what's your key to success when you have to influence somebody you've never met and you want to get that first meeting. And the the top people consistently said two things. Number one, bring something of value and find something in common. 
So that just circles back to what we said at the beginning, find something in common being one of the key ways to uh, connect with people. Uh, let's uh, take a minute uh, to see if you have any questions. We're about the 10 minutes left. Uh, came in right on time. How about that? Oh, here's a question. What should a leader do? Let me go to that one. This is from Sean, if I'm pronouncing that right. What should a leader do? And thank you for the question, by the way, Sean. What should a leader do when he is confused on making the right decision? So let me see if I get this right. Uh, what should a leader do? Uh, well, there are probably two ways to approach that. Uh, if you're the leader and you're not sure what the right decision is, uh, I would ask one, one answer is to do uh, maybe set up an interview with three key stakeholders and ask them questions, much like we asked earlier, and ask them what's important to you about this. Uh, how might this impact you? Uh, what are the pros and cons? What's the worst thing that can happen if we do it this way? So maybe get some, some input for, from other people. If you're trying to influence a leader who is not making the right decision uh, or is, is confused about making the right decision, um, my guess is they might be a steadiness communication style because the S's, those steadiness people, are people pleasers. Uh, they don't like conflict. So if that's the case, then I would recommend, again, starting with questions, find out what's important to the leader, and then gently making a recommendation. You might uh, make that a second meeting, so you're not coming up with the recommendation right then. But in the second meeting, come back and say, you know, I've talked to, I've, I've talked to a few people. Uh, I've looked at this from a number of uh, ways, a uh, number of points of view, and I think the right approach would be this and then emphasize the teamwork. This is the solution that will help the most people and create the least amount of conflict. And here are some reasons why. And that might make them feel comfortable and also give them some ammunition to, if they've got to sell the, le uh, the next leader up the ladder. So hopefully that, that answered your question. Uh, thank you for the questions. Let me go to uh, some others. I'm going to go in line here. All right. Let's see here. Shoot, I might have green. Okay, no, here we go. Okay, uh, this is from Mubashir, if I'm pronouncing that right. How do you know in advance what type of person in whom we are trying to influence? Great question. So if you've never met them, one way to do it is to... Uh, if you have a way to observe them, if they ever present to a team or they're on a conference call, maybe observe them and then use some of the criteria we talked about. Are they fast or slow, uh, people or pay, uh, people or task? Uh, another way is to ask other people, hey, have you worked with Bob? What's he like? Uh, another way is you're in the first meeting uh, and you just observe them. Uh, and and, and the, the, key, the simplest way is to just match the other style. If they're talking fast, talk fast. If they get to the point quickly, get to the point quickly. So just match their style. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. Now let's go to Tan Moy. Um, how, can I convince a, how can I convince a person when he or she is being too stubborn to understand my logic or emotion? Okay, so this sounds like the other person might be that dominant style. They tend to be uh, blunt, direct, not open to other suggestions. So one thing you might want to do is to give them options. Uh, boss, we, you asked me to do it, and give it to them in bullets. Boss, you asked me to come back with solutions on this. Here are three options. One, two, three. I've written down a pro and con for each. Option one, here's, what, here's the pro, here's the, here's the con, and so forth. And then say, what do you think? So. Be, be direct, bulleted, make sure you're not wasting time. That's just one way to think about it. Some, sometimes people are not receptive to us because A, we're not presenting in the right way, B, we might be giving them too much information. Uh, so make sure you're not, 
uh, you, you've got to present in their style. Don't overwhelm them with too many details if it's a dominance person. Uh, just communicate it in their style, and as I said, give, give them some options and let them make the choice. Uh, here's one from Pratit. Uh, excuse me. And uh, they ask, is it possible that people can fit into multiple quadrants of the DISC model? It's a two-part question. Let me ask that one first. Absolutely. When I do my workshops, some people just don't know. They are, in fact, some are so good at flexing their style, they've got almost equal parts of uh, all four uh, styles in them. What you want to do, again, is, is to match match their style. Um, I do want to emphasize that, again, all styles are in all people. Imagine we've got a bar graph in front of us, and the first bar on the left is D, and it's the highest bar. The second one is uh, the lowest. It's a C. Uh, the third bar is, uh, a, uh, I'm sorry, the third bar is an S, and it's low. And the fourth bar is almost as high as the D. So that would mean the person's got a high D, high C. So bullet points and details. So yes, all four styles are in all, are in all people. You want to try to identify the primary style. Focus your presentation that way, but have prepared arguments and points for the, that, that would address the other styles and maybe touch on those as you're presenting. Hopefully that's helpful. Part two of that question, um, if there are styles in, all, in some people, how do we adjust our presentational, pre presentation style in that situation? Again, I, I think we've, we've covered that. Um, any other questions? One last chance. Let's move to slide 50 as we're waiting for any type-ins. Um, so again, uh, thank you for listening. I know I think Eric's going to say some comments at the end. My final comments would be these. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, how, I'm so glad to be uh, supporting you all at IEEE. Thank you. I've got a couple of free offers here. Uh, if you would like one of these, just send me an email. I'm on slide 51 now, the last slide. Um, I am giving a summary card of this uh, webinar. Um, it's actually being adjusted a little bit, so uh, give me a week or two to get that to you. Just send me an email, write IEEE free summary in the line. Uh, two, if you would like a uh, free consultation, uh, I'm not selling anything, I just like to help people on this. Um, if, you, if you want to discuss your, your issue, again, send me an email, IEEE free consultation, glad to talk to you about that phone. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, Again, just IEEE inquiry, uh, and then maybe a little detail about uh, what that might be in the content. And let me just go. We've got one more question here, Tanmoy, and that's another one. Let's see here, Tanmoy. Okay. How long can it take to convince a person about a long-term decision? Well, wow. It can take a long time. I know in sales there are – Decisions that can take up, you know, a year, a one-year decision uh, cycle. So I think one thing you could do is when you're asking the person what's important to them, you're listening, you're asking those questions, is to ask them some questions about the timeline. When are you hoping to implement this? What is the ideal time for uh, making a decision on this? How much information do you need to feel comfortable making that decision? What type of information would you like to see? So get them to spell that all out so that you're not wasting your time doing a lot of work you don't need to or adding information to them, giving them information that might, might confuse or uh, frustrate them. Excellent. Thank you. My time is up. We'll turn it back to Eric. Again, you know how to get in touch with me if you'd like more information or a summary card. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I, I heard all great things about IEEE from my dad growing up. It's a big part of my youth, so I feel like I'm with, back with family. So thanks for listening. Hopefully this has been uh, helpful. Eric? 
Thank you, Roger. That was excellent. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the, of the call, this was part of our early career webinar series. Um, we have more of these um, in, in, uh, scheduled and in line for the rest of the year. The next one will be held on November 11, and it's uh, presenting with impact. So I hope you found today's session valuable, and I look forward to um, engaging and interacting with you on future calls. Um, if you have any questions, again, you can email Roger, or if you have questions about uh, IEEE, the benefits you enjoy, and things of that nature, please just email those to membership at computer.org. Um, thank you, and I look forward to hearing you or seeing you on future calls. Thanks a lot. Bye.